Okay, let's get started. Welcome. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, today we're very happy to have uh, Dr. James uh, uh, Davenport from Western Washington University here to give uh, uh, today's colloquium. Uh, James received his uh, PhD in physics and astronomy from the University of Washington in 2007. Uh, he then uh, studied the open star clusters at San Diego State University uh, and got his master uh, degree there in 2009. Uh, he then went uh, north again back to University of Washington to work on the stellar activity uh, from space-based observations and got his PhD in astronomy earlier this year. Uh, currently he went a bit further north uh, to Western Washington University uh, he is an NSF uh, postdoc fellow there. Uh, his research focuses on the time domain uh, large survey astronomy uh, with emphasis on magnetically active stars in Kepler. James? Great. Okay, that is, that is live. Good. Okay, so. Woo. There's no volume. Okay, so usually when I give this talk, I'm talking to astronomers, and I have to convince them that stellar activity and the sun is actually interesting and important. Um, but I know there's a lot of people here who care about magnetic fields and the sun and things that we can actually see uh, in space. So I think, uh, usually, like I said, this quote I usually use as a, a way of laughing about the fact that astronomers don't care about other stars, and they definitely don't care about the sun, because uh, it's the most boring star in the sky. But I think. Most people here in this audience would agree it's actually the most interesting star or among the most interesting stars in the sky. I'll hopefully convince you that it, there's at least a couple more stars that are worth studying. Um, and I want to start, uh, again, I usually am talking to a, a, a more astronomy-focused audience. So I want to start with a short story that probably is familiar to a lot of people in this audience uh, who study the sun. Um, uh, and that's this awesome story about the British astronomer Richard Carrington, who's actually an amateur astronomer from the 1800s. And he was doing his uh, daily hand drawings of the sun. And so what you have here is from his paper from 1859. And it took me a while to figure out what this compass is. This is north-south, uh, preceding and following. I had to look this up. This took a while to find out. Um, uh, someone was like, maybe it's peace and fest, maybe? That's uh, the way they pronounced it. But no, it's preceding and following. Um, and so what we have here is uh, these, these are the latitude and longitude lines of the sun. Uh, and he was drawing this dark sunspot region. And so he had drawn this region and been following it for a few days as it had rolled. And I think at this point, this is its second pass around on the sun. So it had rolled into view. This is a large sunspot. Uh, it's not so amazingly large that we would be worried about it, but uh, it might have been visible by eye. Uh, it certainly was visible in his, his, his instrument projected on a screen. And he was drawing this spot and writing in his little research diary when he saw these two uh, appearances, these bright appearances labeled A and B here these two flashes of light. And the way he was drawing this, it was projected on a screen. It had like a pinhole that was projecting an image of the sun on the screen, and he put a piece of parchment up, and he would draw on that. He would just you know, sketch and trace the sunspots. So he thought that somebody had poked a hole in his uh, screen. And so he ran downstairs to see what was going on, to get somebody else to look at it. And in the course of about 45 minutes, uh, this active region here uh, had moved and had shifted. Uh, a region the size of Jupiter had evolved and shifted and moved. And what he had observed was the first human witnessed uh, flare. It was, a, it was a solar flare. So these were the two active regions that had lit up. This was the big sunspot region that he'd been drawing. Uh, just to put this in sort of context, this is sort of pasting this onto a more modern STO image, a comparable sized sunspot, uh, which did produce large flares, but nothing the size that he had seen. So this is interesting, and probably I wouldn't be telling you about this. It would be academically interesting, historically interesting, except for it really piques my interest what happened next. Uh, and that was about 12 hours later, uh, the sky lit up in an enormous auroral storm, a magnetic storm that lit up that could be seen as far south as Cuba. Um, and there was these big red aurora that were seen. Uh, some people claimed to have been able to see them during parts of the day. Uh, the New York Times said that it drew people out into the streets um, from the bars and from where they were standing, like what was going on. It lasted for a day. Uh, a series of these events happened over about a week. And what we had was the first connection between what we see on Earth and what we see on the sun. It was a, a real connection between the activity that we see on the sun and what we see here on Earth. Now, there were these beautiful uh, aurora. This inspired paintings and things and art and newspaper articles. There were some real effects that we should consider that I think a lot of people here have thought about, uh, which was like 
uh, telegraph lines inducing massive amounts of charge. So there wasn't electrical grids at this time, but there were long telegraph lines spread across the continent that induced charge from this auroral storm. Uh, some people reported being burned, telegraph operators being burned, like their fingers getting singed by the lines, uh, and communications were interrupted. So there are some real effects here. So what fascinates me is this sort of simple story about this observation of a spot and a flare, and then, of course, the corresponding effect on life. Um, this raises questions that we're still, deal still dealing with uh, today, more than 150 years later, uh, that are simple questions, like how often do these big spots occur? How often do these big flares come from these big spots? How long do they occur? Uh, how big, what's the biggest possible flare you could get? And, and could that flare affect life on the planet or the atmosphere? Could it strip the atmosphere of the planet if it was young and close? Um, and then there's these sort of reverse questions. What do these spots, if we see them, or these flares, tell us about their host star? So if we start counting flares and counting spots, what is that telling us about the star itself? Is that telling us something about the age of the star or, or what it's made of? Um, are the spots and flares the same? Are these basic sort of like butterfly collecting things that we do as scientists where we find something strange and we put them into bins, we count them and try to classify them? Um, the thing that interests me the most, and which I'll revisit at the very end of the talk, um, is this notion of uh, how these flares and these spots occur over the active life of a star. So here is some measure of magnetic activity in stars, not the sun, these are stars. This is sort of painstakingly collected data um, where you've got some calcium flux here and we say these are active stars, these are young, so these are in clusters where we know their ages um, through other means. So the Pleiades, the Hyades, right? Uh, and then here's the sun considered an inactive star. And it was considered an active star 150 years ago when it belched this giant flare that would have wreaked untold damage on our economics if it had hit today. Um, and in fact, about three years ago, the sun produced a similar flare that missed the Earth by about a day. So this is not like an abstract thing. This inactive star is producing these massive belches of magnetic energy, uh, which could be incredibly detrimental to life and would like knock out the internet and my Netflix wouldn't work. And so this would be a horrible catastrophe of untold proportions. Okay, so uh, as I said, this data is sort of painstakingly collected. So okay, this is a 10-year-old reference, but we don't have that many more stars that we can put on a similar kind of diagram where we say there is some evolution between active and inactive. This is very hard to do. You have to watch stars very carefully. You have to pick very careful methods to qual qualify them as active or inactive. And you need to do it for a lot of stars to determine how this evolution uh, changes with stellar mass, uh, with composition. So you need to look at a lot of stars and you need to study them for a long time. And that produces uh, uh, a requirement for data that is nicely met by the Kepler mission. So Kepler was sold as this planet hunting mission. It's a one and change meter telescope studying, or its primary mission studied uh, 105 square degrees of sky for four solid years. And the goal, as it was billed to Congress, uh, was to look for planets, look for an Earth-like planet around a sun-like star. That was the big goal. Uh, and that's a very noble goal. Um, it's not anything that I'm particularly interested in. And the greatest con that was ever pulled is that while you're looking for these uh, planets that pass in front of their host stars, you're actually just studying the stars. And so what we have is up to four years of data on something like 150,000 stars, making this the uh, most exquisite stellar astrophysics mission uh, in decades that we got for basically for free. So topics I'm going to cover based on Kepler. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about star spots, which are the analog of the sunspots that I described, um, and the evolution of these spots in a very active system. Uh, I'm going to talk about star spots in the case of a transit. So we're going to go back and use the transit. We're going to abuse the transit and uh, use it as a method to study the spots themselves of the, of the star. And then finally, I'll talk about flares and things that I'm doing now to study these flares and other stars. Okay, so first, sun, uh, star spots. So this is obviously the sun. I wish we had this kind of data on other stars. This is from the Solar Dynamics Observatory. And I think it's also fun to just show, uh, for reference, the largest sunspot that's ever been photographed. Um, so this occurred in 1947. This was naked eye visible. If you looked at the sun as it was setting, you could see this big spot. Uh, so it's pretty cool to be able to just say, yeah, that. I know I, there are people who are alive who have seen this thing with their eye. Um, the problem with the spot occurring in 1947 is if you Google this, what you end up with is a bunch of Roswell articles, because this happened right about the same time that the aliens landed in New Mexico. So when you, you search for uh, you know, sunspots 1947, you end up with, did sunspots bring the aliens to the planet? You end up with very interesting Google results. Um, so I would encourage you to check that out. 
on the internet. Um, sun star spots are the same thing as sunspots. These are a generic manifestation of magnetic fields piercing a photosphere. You get these bundles of magnetic flux, they come up, they inhibit convection, and they create cool spots. So these are reconstructions on a young star, this is the sun, and this is a uh, giant star, so this is the sun for scale. And you can see here, these are three different examples of star spots, cool regions um, that happen usually as a result of magnetic fields, though in the case of giants, not always. Um, they evolve in terms of the sun on time scales of days and maybe months. The average sunspot only lasts for a few days, maybe a few months if it's a very big one. Um, when we look at other stars, and certainly I'll show this here in this talk, we see this time scale might be years or longer. There may be things that last millions or billions of years uh, on other stars. So very unlike what we see on the sun. Um, and because they are the manifestation of localized magnetic fields, they trace the magnetic field geometry. They also uh, conveniently trace the rotation and possibly the differential rotation. So this is how differential rotation was measured on the sun. So the parameters that we care about uh, when we think about stars, not just the sun, um, we care about basic physics. We care about how fast is the star rotating, how big are the spots that it's generating, so how much magnetic flux is there. Um, is there, so these are sort of second order effects, how long do these spots live, and is there differential rotation? And by this I mean, does the equator spin faster than the poles? So on the sun we see the equator rotates every roughly 25 days, the poles are something like every 28 days. So there is this shear which is related to where the spots occur and how big they are. And these two bullet points here I would call sort of unanswered questions, um, uh, outstanding challenges maybe is a better way to put it to funding agencies. Uh, stellar activity and stellar cycles. Uh, so do we see things like on the sun, this 11 year cycle of activity where the sun reaches some maximum every 11 years and produces more flares and more spots and then goes into a dormant period every, every, uh, every half point of the cycle. Uh, and then this is something that uh, I'm working on now, uh, the evolution of these sorts of phenomena with stellar age. Let's first look at just these two, these basic two parameters we measure. Um, now Kepler is not uh, a spectrograph, it's a very simple imager. So it just takes a picture of the same field of view over and over. There's no wavelength information, there's no color information, it just takes a white light, so the entire visible spectrum uh, picture every 30 minutes and every one minute in some cases. So it's just a very basic picture. So all we get is brightness versus time for all these sources. So how do we infer the presence and the size of a star spot? So this simple animation gives you an idea. Uh, if you had a perfectly circular spot pasted on a sphere as it rotates, you'd get some sinusoidal-like uh, modulation where the spot rolls out of view, the star gets brighter as the spot rolls back into view, the star gets fainter, so the flux goes down. So you measure the period of this sine wave that gives you the rotation rate of the star. Uh, if the spot was larger, this flux modulation would be bigger. Um, so this is a very simple kind of measurement. We're looking for sinusoidal features. Uh, we, would match, we would map this uh, period and this phase of the sinusoid back to the longitude at which this spot is. And just to prove to you that I'm not crazy, uh, here are a few examples from the early Kepler data where we see indeed sinusoidal modulations uh, at different periods. So this is a fast rotating star, this is a slow rotating star, this one has smaller spots, this one has a large spot, uh, assuming the size scale of this graph is the same. So what we'd like to do is measure sort of second order effects. We'd like to see how this sinusoidal modulation sort of shifts with time. Does it fall out of sync? Does it change with amplitude over time? Does a second sinusoid pop up? Um, this is all the data we have to work with. So we have to learn how to exploit this sort of wiggle as well as we can. So I'm going to start by talking about what has become my favorite star besides the sun, um, which is a low mass star called GJ1243. Uh, it's not a terribly memorable name. Uh, it is a low mass star. It has a spectral class of M4, which means it has a mass of about 20% to the sun. So this is a small star. Uh, we call an M dwarf. And it's a very rapid rotator. Uh, so the rotation period is about 14 hours, so 0.6 days as compared to the sun, which rotates every 25 or 28 days, depending on where you measure it, this thing is cooking. It is spinning really, really fast. So we get this really fast sinusoidal uh, pattern. There's also all these flares, uh, which is fodder for the next part of the talk, where we come back and look at the flares. But we're going to ignore the flares, and we're just going to focus on uh, this sort of stable or quasi-stable oscillation here. Um, 
we want to look at, so this primary dip here is stable over many years. And in fact, we have ground-based data which says it's stable for at least a decade, which is interesting. This secondary feature here uh, represents a second spot. And this feature, uh, and this is a PowerPoint drawing, so it's a little crude. This feature evolves on time scales of something like hundred or hundreds of days. So what we want to do, the goal here, um, is to try to measure the evolution of this sort of quasi-sinusoidal shape. And to do that, we want to take this shape and move it by one period and then move it by another period and see how the shape changes. We want to look at this sort of phase evolution. So this is my crude drawing, so bear with me here. Um, we want to move it by phase and then look with time how that shape of that phase changes. Okay, so that's the PowerPoint animation version of that. Um, and then we really do this with real data, of course. So this animation I'm going to show you uh, is just that. On the right is just the phase folded and stacked four-year light curve for this data. And you can see these features, these little wiggles, move around in phase. On the left is the exact same data, but instead of encoding the brightness as the shade of the pixel here. So this is like a flux map with time versus longitude. So this dark band here, um, these dark bands are the spots. The dark band is the minimum in the sine wave moving coherently in phase or equivalently in longitude. We also have, and it's a little hard to see in this way, um, a constant dip, a spot that seems to basically be totally stable in size and in phase over four years. Um, so this is kind of a mesmerizing animation, but maybe not a super instructive diagram. So I think it's better to show it uh, turned over on its side where time evolves left to right. So let's roll it on its side and then let's fold it twice so you can see these features kind of wiggling around. So I think this is a little bit more clear. You can see, again, this is a spot that's constant in longitude, which means it's not moving on the surface. And then you see these sort of transient uh, secondary blobs. In fact, this one might, might be rolling all the way through. And this we think is the sign uh, of differential rotation. Now, it's fine to make these pretty plots. And certainly, this was a visualization that was instructive to us when we were first looking at this data set, first trying to figure out what to do with four years of brightness of 14-hour wiggles over four years. Uh, oh, I should say these gaps, right? These bands right here that appear. Uh, uh, one of the chips on Kepler died, and the star unfortunately fell on that chip every quarter, or every, every fourth quarter. So once a year, starting in this year, uh, we couldn't observe it because that chip was dead. So these are not uh, astrophysically real. So what we want to do, uh, it's nice to make this graph. We'd like to teach the computer to trace these features. So what we're going to do is we're going to chop the data uh, into little windows of time. So we're going to take a small window of time and assume that the, the spot is constant and is static. And then we'd like to te tell the computer to tell us where the spots are to, to get the computer to fit this light curve. And so just to illustrate this, uh, you have some kind of sphere. You put a couple of spots on it. You stick it into an MCMC solver and you let the computer move the spots around until it finds the positions that it thinks the spots are. And you do that over one window of time. So this is an illustration of just two independent windows of time. Here I've got the phase folded light curve and the blue line is the uh, addition of the two spots. And these are done independently. So within each window of time, we're doing a static solution, figuring out the locations of the spots um, at a given time. Uh, and then we'd like to trace that. Uh, so we use this brand of MCMC, if that matters to you. Um, and this is what we get. So every pair of circles here is the result of a full MCMC run, where we stick one window of time of data into our, uh, into our light curve modeling suite. And we tell it to put two spots on the star and move them wherever it pleases. What we get back here is the longitude of those two spots over time. And these two linear-like features uh, that I'm highlighting here, we think these secular features are the result of differential rotation. Now, we don't have much resolution on the latitude. These models consistently put this, this purple spot at a lower latitude and this orange spot at a higher latitude. So this long-lived spot is at a higher latitude. And this short-lived one is at, uh, uh, this transient one is at the lower latitude. This one is moving at a faster period. Um, so that's why I've drawn this arrow here larger. And we assume is that a, uh, we, we have fixed them to calculate this differential rotation rate. Uh, but the punchline is this is 10 times slower amplitude differential rotation than we see on the sun. So this evolution is very slow. The spot is moving very, very gradually across the surface. Uh, and you're seeing spot lifetimes, again, that are hundreds of days. Um, so this, this feature right here lasts about 500 days. It's much, much longer than anything we see on the sun. So we've learned a few lessons from this. It's very hard, as I said, to constrain the latitude of these spots. 
Um, the models put them at this range of latitudes, and it doesn't really converge uh, ever. Uh, you can track only about two of these sinusoidal wiggles. There's an indication maybe you can do three wiggles at a time through a light curve, but that's about it. And on the sun, we see many more spots than two at any given time. Uh, and you can only track, it really prefers this very slow evolution. And there's a question, uh, I didn't really talk about this, there's a question about how cool the spots are. We had to assume uh, temperature for the spots. There's no way to measure it from the Kepler data. The transit case helps all of these problems. Many, but probably all of these problems. And so let me illustrate that. If you have um, a star, a rotating star here, with many spots, I think in this, in this model I put seven spots, um, and you turn the star around, and we slow time down as the planet passes in front of the star. As the planet passes in front of the star, normally you get a dip. We call it a transit. Um, if there is a big spot in there, you get this bump because the, spot, the, star, uh, the, sorry, the planet is crossing a lower temperature feature. So we get these transits. This is from the planet. The planet moves at a regular period. Uh, we get this broad out of transit modulation, which is like what we saw in the case of that low mass M dwarf. Um, which from here you can only measure sort of the bulk properties of the spots. But these little bumps, these little teeth or bumps in the transits, give you a lot of detail in one dimension about the location and the sizes of the spots. You're getting this one dimensional map across the path of the transit in, in very high detail. And we didn't invent this technique. It's been done a few times with HST. It's been done with Kepler for a very fascinating and complicated system. Um, and this is a system that Kepler also observed which is being studied. It's been studied before, and there's people at the University of Washington um, that I'm collaborating with that we're working on it again. Now, one really neat thing you can do with this, as a result of the fact that the planet is opaque, um, is the height of this bump tells you the temperature of the spots. So if the bump was very cold, was almost pitch black, then as the planet passed over it, you'd get a very big bump. The spot would create a very big bump. If the spot was just slightly cooler than the surrounding photosphere, you get a very small bump, a very small difference in the flux blocked by the planet. And so just by reading the height of the bump gives you a, a measurement um, from white light, from no spectral information, gives you a measurement of the temperature of the star spot uh, relative to the photosphere. And what's awesome is, we, this is, so this is a real bump, a real piece of data, we see bumps that have uh, flux contrast ratios right around 70 or 80%, um, which is fairly consistent with what we see on the solar umbra. So, this is pretty cool that we're able to measure this, uh, make a solar-like measurement just from uh, a white light time series light curve um, uh, with no spatial resolution whatsoever. Okay, so we'd like to play the same game of uh, telling us where the spots are over time to get things like differential rotation and spot lifetimes. Um, we need to do it tracking these bumps. So this hadn't been done before, so we first started with a simulated data set so where we can control the answer. Uh, so we used a, a semi-analytic model uh, by a collaborator, Joe Lama, uh, who started with uh, his, his light curve generating model where he inputs a solar butterfly-like diagram. So these are spot locations over time. Um, he then inputs realistic differential rotation, spot evolution and migration, diffusion time scales and things, things that are good uh, and have physics behind them. And he generates us a light curve, and then he puts a planet. So this is my Jupiter-like planet going over my illustration and you get transits. Um, so what's very cool is uh, in this light curve, this is the model light curve, so there's no noise, so it's perfectly flat and noiseless. But we see these nice big bumps that are comparably sized to the bumps that we see in the Kepler data. Um, so we had them generate four years of data at a similar sampling rate to the Kepler data. I like, uh, this is just one 60 day window. I like this window because you can see the out of transit modulation uh, evolving away as one big spot group is diffusing away. Um, so this is kind of a cool window. You can kind of see the diff something like the diffusion time scale right here, uh, just from the outer transit modulation. Um, and yeah, you can see this is a very large planet. The planet radius relative to the stellar radius is 10%. So this is a very large planet. So we play the same game as before. We take a window of light curve, and we assume that the spots are fixed over that window. And here we're using about one rotation period for our window. And then we let the MCMC, uh, the Markov Chain Monte Carlo algorithm, decide where to put spots. Um, so here's just an animation. Uh, so one window of time, we stick it into our MCMC solver. This is a window of the burn-in, so it's actually kind of the worst part of the MCMC, but it's the most dramatic looking. Um, 
And you can see very quickly, the, so there's a thousand different walkers testing out parameter space, which is the sphere of the star. And very quickly, within a few hundred time steps, you see it clustering down into locations along the path of the transit. So that's why they're all uh, along the plane, uh, the midplane of the star. Uh, you see the locations, uh, the probable locations of spots start to form from the solver. So the solver is doing its job. Um, and you have to let this go for a long time. And then you repeat the process on the next window, a totally independent solution. The windows don't talk to each other. These are independent models. And so what we'd like to do is, from this, uh, from this kind of data, so we would say the spot, there's a spot here, there's a spot there, there's a spot there, um, in this example. We would like to trace this evolution over time. So that's what this plot is here. Uh, well, I'm going to illustrate it first. So if a spot was not evolving with longitude, say it was rotating at whatever the mean rotation rate of the star was, then you'd see this horizontal feature. If the spot sort of evolved and decayed, you'd see a, a set of points here over time. Um, if the spot was moving slower than the mean period, say it was at a higher latitude, it would be tipped up in this diagram. And if it was faster, so maybe at a lower latitude than whatever the mean rotation rate is, you'd have things dipped lower. And you have to get a tennis ball and draw on it and spin it around to convince yourself that uh, advancing in longitude means it's slower. But I did got a tennis ball out and drew on it and spun it around and convinced myself this is correct. So this is uh, upward facing lines would be slower than whatever the rotation period is. And this, again, is qualitatively the same as what we were doing with this M dwarf. We're looking for the pitches of these features. This pitch here in phase was telling us that it was very, very slow. So hundreds of days versus um, less than uh, one whole rotation of the star. So this is, from the model results, uh, the locations and sizes of spots over time. So the point size and the point color are encoding the radius. And so you see, and we, of course we input model differential rotation, so we had better see things differentially rotating. We see things moving at different rates, different periods, than the average rate of the star. Um, and we can see things like evolving and decaying away and evolving. This actually is a merging of two, two regions. So it evolves and decays and then gets clumped into another one and then decays. And we see this, this is exactly the evolution we're looking for. We can recover something related to the size of the spot and its location and longitude with time. And again, just to emphasize, each set of points at time in, uh, are the result of one independent model. Um, so we're burning a lot of computer time here, which is always good. Now I can draw circles around this and say this is one feature, this is a feature, this is a feature. Um, and in this diagram, this would be fine. In the real data, it's much more noisy. So we need to train uh, some kind of machine learning algorithm to pick out uh, the significant clumps and figure out what their uh, tilts are. Thankfully, there are such machine learning algorithms. We don't have to write them ourselves. Um, and so this is the result of what we use. We, this is the DB scan. This is the density-based kernel uh, uh, clustering with noise where it finds these significant features. It finds some spurious features as well, like this, which are garbage, um, and some low, sig uh, some low signal ones here. This one's probably garbage. But for the most part, you're finding a lot, an, a lot of uh, tracks of star spots. So each individual cluster here is nominally one star spot moving in longitude and in changing its radius with time. So this is exactly what we were hoping to recover. And because it was, again, a model, we knew how much differential rotation and spot evolution there was. So by measuring these pitches, uh, we're able to back out the differential rotation rate. Uh, and because it was a model and you were scientists, we set this differential rotation rate coefficient to 1, because what else would you set it to? Uh, and we recover something within 1% of that um, from this range of uh, rotation periods. So this is very encouraging that we, know, we possibly know what we're doing. Now, one other cool side thing we can do is from a given track is measure uh, its evolution and radius with time, something like the area with time. Now, because I come from a stellar background, I didn't know what a microhemisphere was. So this was a little bit of literature research for me to figure out what that funny unit is. Um, but we're measuring the, so this is from the model again. This is one model star spot. And you can see I've highlighted it in red here. Uh, it evolves very slowly. Now, we told this model to have very long-lived star spots to diffuse much slower. Um, but I would love to find more solar-like data uh, that I could compare this to. So this is maybe one of the better references I've found uh, is Hathaway 2008, where uh, they've measured the size, the area of single spots over time. And so this is their data uh, for sunspots. And so this is kind of sparse data. 
and we have sparse data. So it seems like we should be able to make a comparable measurement uh, on stars that we're making on the sun. And that's when I get really excited, is when we can measure solar-like features uh, on other stars um, without having the resolution to do it. Okay, so that's all been for a model-like curve. Let's move on to a real-like curve. So the star we're gonna focus on here is Kepler-17. Uh, it's a G2, so the same spectral type as the sun. It's rotating about twice as fast as the sun, so it's a more active star than the sun. Uh, it has its own Wikipedia page, so you know it's a really neat star because it has its own Wikipedia page. And the reason it does is because it hosts an uh, exoplanet, an exosolar planet, Kepler-17b. This is a super Jupiter-sized planet, so it's 13%. It's even bigger than our model planet. It's 13% the size of the star, uh, and it's orbiting at 1.5 days. That's super duper fast. So Mercury orbits every 80 days. This thing's orbiting every 1.5 days. So this thing is really close to its host star, and it's really big, um, which makes it perfect for what we want to study. Now, out of total coincidence, um, this 12-day rotation and this 1.5-day orbit um, is close to an 8 to 1 ratio. This is a total coincidence. We don't think there's anything astrophysically interesting here. What this means is every eighth time the planet passes in front of its star, it's covering almost the same longitude. Again, this is a coincidence, but it's very convenient because it means we make these very uh, instructive graphs where, say, this is every eighth transit. You can see this bump evolve and then start to decay. Here's another example of every eighth transit, the bump sort of evolving and then kind of decaying. And it's a little noisy, um, but there, there's interesting patterns here that we can pick out. Again, this is a convenient feature of the system, which makes it easy to graph. Um, so we want to play the same game. This is just the exact same slide as before. We want to take windows of time where we're going to assume a static stationary solution, uh, and we're going to let the MCMC do its job. And this, I'll just jump to uh, one window of time where we have an answer. So here is the actual Kepler data where we've downsampled it out of, uh, out of transit here to beat down the signal to noise. Um, during the transit, which pops up, now, uh, you can see the data uh, has pretty significant noise, uh, but the transit is very significant, and these very large bumps start to appear. And for the most part, we do a pretty good job of recovering the sizes and positions of these bumps. Uh, and a reminder, this is just one window of time. We do this for hundreds of windows of time where we move the solution and repeat. So we move, it, move the window of time over. We actually do it by half, half windows, so we get some overlap. Um, and we do an independent run. And what's great, going back to this convenience of an 8 to 1 ratio, um, there we go. So this was the observation, and we repeat it. We, we find, and I guess it's not particularly showing up here, um, I have a little circle that highlights this. We, ha we find features that move coherently in longitudes. They move with respect to the transit, uh, and they change with shape, time, change in radius. So I've shown you before, uh, a couple times now, longitudinal evolution. The longitude, which is what we're measuring here, we're tracing the longitude, like where in the transit is it? If it's over here, it's on the left side of the star. If it's over here, it's on the right side of the star uh, at the moment of transit. Uh, so I've shown you this longitude evolution before, uh, but I wasn't myself prepared for how complicated it would be when we ran these models. And so I'll just blow your minds here, or at least blew my mind when I saw it. Uh, it's a total mess. There are features that seem coherent, that seem to move. Some seem to wiggle around. This thing, I, so this would be a feature that's moving uh, roughly at the same rotation rate as the star as a whole. Again, these are data gaps, just like with uh, our star in the beginning, where the system becomes unobservable for a quarter. We see features like this, where it's totally chaos. Things seem to be running into each other. Some things like this look very clean, exactly like our models, where you see emergence and then decay, and then unfortunately it hits a data gap. Um, some features like this don't seem to change in radius at all. Um, and just again, to make this uh, brutally clear, these would be rotation, ra rotation rates equal to the mean period. This would be slower, and this would be faster. We ran this through our machine learning clustering algorithm, uh, and we are able to possibly track the location and position of over 100. So it recovered what it said was 129 significant clusters or significant star spot features. Um, we can argue about every single one of these, if whether or not they're significant. Is this one significant feature? This one seems very clear and clean. This one seems kind of wacky, like the clustering algorithm might have gotten a little over ambitious. But certainly, there is the presence of 
order 100 different spots. And this is, I think, a really unique uh, uh, domain to be in. We have 100 star spots on a star besides the sun being traced uh, for their size and their longitude over four years. And when we make some back of the envelope estimates for where the latitude distribution should be for these spots, um, we find a differential rotation rate that's something like uh, a few times larger than solar. So this thing has more differential rotation than the sun compared to that M dwarf before uh, where this K value is something like 0.0001. It would be very slow, almost solid body rotation. So this is, I think, pretty exciting. We're measuring solar-like things on, a sun, on the star besides the sun. Uh, we have something like the contrast or the temperatures of many star spots that we can trace with time. Uh, we could estimate their sizes and their positions fairly reliably uh, and not worry about blending different star spots. You know if the, if the planet crosses over it and there's a bump, there must be something there. So we're able to track the evolution of order 100 star spots over four years. Um, and possibly estimate the differential rotation law, which is, again, is something very, very difficult to do for anything besides the sun. Um, and as I showed uh, a few slides ago, this decay profile, the radius of time, might give us something, some kind of handle on the diffusion time scale of these spots, which would be very exciting. OK, and then part three, and what I'm working on now, and so I want to spend the rest of the talk focusing on, is flares. Um, yeah. Um, not for this system. There are systems where I think we can. Um, so as, I don't have it quickly. Um, the system that I've been showing has a planet, and we know this, the planet is crossing right around the midplane of the star, and the orbital and rotation axes are aligned, like they are in our solar system. There are planets that we've seen where the orbital and rotation axes are misaligned, and so the planet stripes like this. And so then you get to uh, study a range of latitudes unambiguously. So where in the transit directly lines up to what latitude and longitude you're striping. Um, now there are arguments about whether or not the planet will pass around, uh, if the, the sampling will be dense enough to do the same kind of analysis. So you're, those are sort of competing factors. But we think we should be able to do that. So that Kepler-63 system, no, Kepler, yeah, Kepler-63 that I mentioned earlier uh, is one such system where they are misaligned. Uh, and you might be able to unambiguously state the latitude and longitude of the spots. And then you would be able to uh, know the sign of the differential rotation. Right, because there are some good theoretical arguments for why you might have anti-solar differential rotation for the slow rotators. Now, all these are fast rotators, so you don't expect it there, naively at least. OK, so, so I want to finish by talking about flares, which is kind of the other very dramatic manifestation of magnetic activity that you see in light curves. So before, we've been talking about cool spots. Now, this is a UV image of the sun, so these are the spots. They appear brighter in this filter. And this would be a big flare event, and you get this nice mass ejection here and all other physics that terrify stellar astronomers because we can't measure them. Um, we think they must be there, but we don't know because we can't see them. You know, things, these are like little wisps and things. You just don't see them in other stars. Uh, and I'm going to put this up in quotes, uh, the so-called standard solar flare model uh, that the stellar astronomers just adopt because we don't know any better. Um, and so I think we have a serious naivety here. This, this might not be the preferred model in the solar physics community anymore. Um, I frankly don't know. But this is what we use. We assume that there is some nice pinch, a magnetic field loop like this that we do see on the sun. There is some pinch. It causes a reconnection event of the magnetic field. You get a fast electron beam that comes down and slams into the photosphere, so somewhere down here. Uh, there is indications that it might not just be an electron beam uh, based on scaling arguments from how big the flares we see are. Uh, and then what we see, and then this would be like the footprint of the spots that we we're looking at before. This is all great, and I think there's lots of reasons to believe such a model exists uh, on the sun. But with Kepler, we don't get any of that. All we see is just this brightness at the photosphere, what we so-called white light flare. This is a very, very difficult thing to measure on the sun. In the sun, you're typically measuring a one angstrom window, a tiny window of wavelength, and you're measuring it over a tiny spatial. You might be watching just this, this chunk of space on the photosphere, and you won't see anything equivalent to the white light we see with Kepler. Well, Kepler is from 400 to 800 nanometers. Uh, that's, that's a much larger wavelength range that you're uh, summing over. So it's very hard to compare what we're seeing with Kepler to directly what you see with the sun. 
um, which is a shame because you have like almost infinity number of photons coming from the sun. So it's, it's, it's very hard to make comparable observations, unfortunately. Now Kepler, because again, it's got a long baseline of time, it's studying 100 plus thousand stars. This turns out to be a stellar flare machine. Um, the bandpass isn't quite optimal for finding flares, but still the, the photometry is very precise. Um, so of order 0.01% photometry. So plenty precise to pick up small changes in the total uh, flux of the star. Um, and importantly, you get complete samples. On the ground, there's this pesky uh, behavior where the sun rises nearly every day. Uh, and this causes gaps in your data, uh, pretty regular gaps in your data. So this is hard to get complete flare rates, though not impossible. Um, and uh, it's hard to get a huge range of flare energies. From Kepler, you're able to do this because you have such precise photometry. So you're able to look for super large events like this Carrington event we talked about where the total brightness of the star changes by a factor of a few. And you're able to look for very small events because your precision is very good. And again, just to convince you I'm not lying, here's that same four stars, four low mass stars with these star spot signatures. And every one of these little spikes on top of that is a result of a stellar flare. So the flares are abundant. Now these are low mass stars. Again, these are a quarter or so the size of the sun in mass. And so these stars are known to be very active. So that's why we're studying them, because they're a plentiful activity. And just to go back to our favorite star, uh, GA 1243, here is a two-day window of that star where, again, you have the 14-hour rotation. And you have these very bright peaks, these bright peaks where, uh, in this case, this peak, I've chopped it off for the graph, this peak goes up past probably the third floor. Um, this was like a 40, no, this was like a 100% flux increase. It was a humongous flux increase. In this two-day window, there are 50 flares that we're able to see. That's, about a, that's around a flare an hour. And we see that flare rate maintained through uh, many, so in this case, we're using the short cadence, so there's only 11 months of data. So um, a flare an hour for 11 months is a big sample. So the goal becomes collect them all. Go through this data set and find every little spiky thing over several orders of magnitude. Um, now this is a really good uh, machine learning problem and classification problem. Uh, it also is a really good problem to put undergrads to work on. Um, and so that's what we did. So we wrote a nice little uh, analysis tool. This is an IDL, because um, we started writing it many years ago. So we call it Flares by Eye, or FBI, because as scientists, we have the best naming of things ever. Um, it's not quite a NASA acronym, because it's five letters instead of four letters, but it's good. Uh, it is open, openly available. You can download it if you are uh, happy to use IDL. And all it is is just a light curve presentation and uh, event identification tool. You click on things, and it stores it in a little database. It's a nice little tool. Uh, we built it to look for flares. There is some very crude auto finding available. Um, it's terrible in this uh, version of the software. But this is the whole goal, is you stick a small army of students on this 11-month data set, and you let them go to work. And what they do is they pick the start and stop times of things that they think are flares. And then you average all those results together to get rid of the students who didn't know what they were doing or were falling asleep. Um, and what you get is this great training set uh, for future auto finders, which is what I'm working on now. Here, here is one ex uh, fun example. This is, I guess, is getting a little washed out. I apologize. But here I've colored the points by the number of users over this uh, day-long chunk of light curve uh, where the flares, where they agreed on flares. So the red points here, high agreement. So everybody agreed that's a flare. Everybody agreed that's a flare. Everybody agreed this was a flare, but there is a gradient in agreement with the tail of the event. Uh, and this is an indication that we need to be careful. People don't agree because this is like a detrending problem. You have to, in your mind, paste what you think the quiescent star is doing underneath this. So this was a, a big warning that we need to do this carefully. And so we ended up picking the outermost limits uh, and then fitting models to them to get rid of the bias. OK, so when you add, again, 11 months of data up, uh, 300 days of data at one minute sampling and about a flare an hour, you get over 6,100 events. So 6,107 is the total number of unique flaring events that are in this data set. Now, I wrote this down uh, a while ago, most for any star besides the sun. Um, but if you look at, like, SDO, if you add all the flares in the SDO catalog up, it's really close. They have, like, like within about 50 of this. So we're really close. Uh, we might, at one point, have been more flares than SDO had seen. I think SDO has just passed us this year. Uh, but So this is, uh, this is a huge catalog. You start to do very interesting things with this. Um, 
as a general uh, interesting note, and I'll talk about this more in a minute, 15% uh, of the flares are complex, where they don't obey a simple explosive uh, exponential decay profile. They have multiple peaks. Uh, this is by, again, this is human classified, 15%. Um, and they span uh, six orders of magnitude in energy. And just for comparison, that Carrington event, the large solar flares, something like 10 to the 32 ergs. So these are, these are very big events. Now here's one thing that I think will be interesting to some people in this audience. This is the, what we call the cumulative flare frequency distribution. So this is uh, energy on the x-axis. Damn, this should be log energy, I'm sorry. Uh, and this is, on the y-axis, the cumulative number of events that are bigger than a given event. So we've added them up in the reverse order. So from here, there are this many number of events larger than 10 to the 32, and this many 10 to the 31. So it, what you get is this very, very clean power law shape. Now, on this end, you're Poisson limited because these events are very rare, and even with 11 months, there's only a handful of very big flares. On this end, you're reaching the detection limit, and the detection limit does change quarter to quarter, so this is not always a hard cut. What's interesting, I mean, this straight, clean line is very interesting, but what's very interesting is that it might not be perfectly straight. And so this is a PowerPoint drawing, so you'll have to forgive the crudeness, but this would be a black line fit to the bulk of the sample here. This uh, are flares that are false. We, we've injected fake flares and tried recovery. We should be si sensitive to these flares. And there seems to be a bit of a break here in this power law, which is saying something about um, how these events are generated, that they're maybe not all self-similar. Um, this would be very interesting if we could find this on other stars. Uh, we need to do more of these sort of fake flare tests to, to verify whether or not this is true. Uh, but this would be very interesting. Um, now, when you have a large sample of things, uh, again, we do the butterfly collecting thing where we classify them as simple or complicated. But you can do other interesting things, statistical things. This, for example, is what happens when you, when you stack every single one of the so-called cleanest, the best signal noise events on top of each other and you add them together. This red line is the median of about 800 of these clean events. Um, and you're able to upsample them. You're able to shift them around and upsample. We've scaled them to a relative flux and to a relative time scale, so they all stack because they're of different energies. But we are able to upsample them and get a very high fidelity uh, median flare shape. And I'm going to blow these, the, the rise and the decay up here. Uh, the rise phase, you see, has this very impulsive, explosive growth. Uh, we fit it with a fourth order polynomial just for the convenience of being able to fit events. The decay, the, here I'm showing it in log flux, the decay shows two exponential uh, regimes, a, a, a rapid decay and then a very slow decay. Now this had been seen on flares for a long time, but it is very cool um, to see that it's self-similar over many orders of magnitude. The flares all fit this shape, which is very cool. Now you can go back and fit single events, and it was trained, that shape was trained on these events, so it's good that it fits it reasonably well. But you can also use that shape to start decomposing the so-called complex events. So this is a very complex event. There may be some quasi-periodic oscillation in this uh, decay phase. There's another big flare out here. There's another, uh, there's secondary and tertiary major peaks. This is a very complicated explosive event. Um, there are problems. We use a very simple iterative approach to fit this, which is not a great approach. It's simple, and that's why we did it. Uh, but you can see, like, there are flares that kind of stack. This, this might have been better fit by maybe one flare here instead of one, two. Uh, there are problems here, but unambiguously, it identifies uh, complicated events. And so here's a couple other examples of that fitting and decomposing complex events. This is something that's never been studied in bulk properties uh, in, a, in, a, in a large sample before. Uh, there are events like this which sort of defy classification. This has a nice uh, initial peak and then a very beautiful big flare. This is actually quite a large. This is in the top 10% of our sample in terms of energy. And then there's this very bizarre linear decay of flux. There's no oscillations. The error bars are about the size of these points, maybe a little bit bigger. Um, there's a very strange linear, not exponential decay. Uh, we have no idea what this is. There's a handful of these just sort of strange weirdos in the data uh, that sort of defy fitting. Uh, there's no superposition of those flare templates that are going to give you this shape. Um, so this could have been some kind of interesting arcade, or this could be the flare rolling out of view. We don't know. These are just sort of off-the-cuff uh, thoughts that we had we put in the paper. Now this star has a rapid rotation again. Uh, there is no correlation with flare uh, energies or numbers of flares. So here I've just upsampled the star spot. I'm just showing the star spot for one month. So you can get a sense that this is the main dip 
from the main primary star spot. There's no preferred phase. The flares are happening all over the star, which is very, very interesting. They're not just strictly following the location of these giant spots. And for these complex flares, we can decompose them. We can start, again, we can put them in buckets. We can say most flares have one peak, and there is this decay of number of flares, so how complex is complex? This is an interesting thing. Uh, this is a plot from a conference proceeding that hit the archive today. So if you search me on the archive today, this is available. Um, and one, one more interesting thing that we've started to tease apart that I'd like to talk to people, especially solar physicists about, um, is the composition of these complex events. So when we take the thousand or so complex flares and we decompose where the biggest and the second biggest peaks are, we see about two thirds of them have uh, the biggest peak first, the second biggest peak second. Uh, we could go on to the third biggest peak, and so we haven't done this. Uh, this was just sort of an exploratory graph. This uh, dearth of points in the middle here, this is because uh, you can't find things that are right up against, you can't disentangle flares that happen right against each other due to the one minute sampling. Um, but there's an interesting preferen preference for the biggest peak to be first, the second biggest peak to be second, which might be telling us something about some sort of arcade of things happening uh, some of the energy budget of flare regions decaying with subsequent reflares. Um, the time scale, there's no, uh, there, there's sort of these peaks in the time scale. I'm not sure if these are significant given the one minute sampling of the data, but if they are, uh, say if this peak, this uh, peak to peak separation has a preferred time scale, this might have something to do with the size scale of active regions next to each other, right, times the alphane speed or something. Uh, again, I'm a solar uh, observer, I'm a stellar observer, not a solar physicist. So this is what I need solar physicists to help uh, calibrate my understanding. My question is, what are the things like this, disentangling these complicated features, that would be interesting? That would tell us something about the physics of where the flares are coming from, the energy budget of the active regions. So, yeah, so I put it up. What can the complex flares tell us about the triggering or sympathetic flares or the shape of active regions? This is something that I don't have an answer to and that I need people who are smarter than me to tell me. Um, so again, there's a, proceeding, a conference proceedings from the summer uh, on the archive today, and I would encourage anyone who thinks they have answers or even just intelligent questions to read it and send me an email. But big questions in general are still awaiting us. See, again, sympathetic or triggered flares, the structure of these complex events, and this big one down here which is driving my interest, and so I'll just finish by saying this, this flare rate versus age. We have a big sample. I've only shown you data from two stars. It's taken me an hour to talk about two stars. Um, it would be nice to study all 100,000 or so. And so let me just briefly talk about the future work. Uh, again, today is back to the future day. If you didn't know, this is the day that they come, when they come to the future, it's today. Uh, so this is the back to the future style future work logo. So just to revisit this idea of activity versus age. The sun, it flares a lot, it has lots of spots, and that's an inactive star. And we'd like to know, what is the slope of this line for all stars? Is it universal? Is there a mass dependence? Can we learn to read this clock? Right? If we were able to calculate this based on flares, if the active stars had the most flares and inactive stars like the sun had fewer flares that we saw, then by measuring the flare rate, you would have some kind of crude clock. And the question is, can we learn to read that clock? Can we do it in a statistical way? And can we use the Kepler, the incredible light curves from Kepler, which, and future missions like TESS, uh, which will only be around for a little while, to inform what we might see from giant ground-based surveys like the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, which will take a movie of the sky over a decade, a sparsely sampled movie of the sky, to be sure, only a few hundred visits over a decade, um, but over the entire sky, not over 100 square degrees like Kepler. And so when you have light curves of a billion stars, if you can learn to crudely read this clock, that variability and spots and flares, if you can learn to read this clock very carefully and precisely with Kepler, then we can use things like LSST to get some kind of age map of our galaxy. And so this is where I'm going. This is what I'm interested in over the next few years. And so I'll just put my conclusions up and say that now I think is the golden age right now of statistics about stellar activity. We have the perfect data sets to be doing this with large numbers and with complete sam samples. Um, and an outstanding question that's driving my interest and I'd love to talk to people here in Boulder a lot about, what can we, we being stellar astronomers who are studying these data sets learn from and learn with the solar community. And that's what I'll say. More James? Uh, the uh, calcium, uh, you make, made reference to the uh, flare rate 
as a function of the of the of the age. And uh, but what we do know is that the uh, activity calcium two varies with, uh, in particular, with the inverse Rossby number, with rotation. Mm. Well, my question is, uh, do you s see or have seen any dependence of any of the flare parameters on the inverse Rossby number? There has not before been a data set where we could have made the measurement. There have been a few boutique studies of flare rates in some of these clusters, but they've been pretty incomplete. Kepler, or K2 in its new incantation, uh, is observing several of these clusters and several others. We'll be able to make that determination, I think, in the next year or two. Um, there certainly has been measurements of like uh, UV and X-ray luminosity of stars that is also coherent. So here I'm showing the calcium flux, but there's also uh, X-ray flux and uh, UV flux that seems to coherently decrease with time, and we see that also with the mass dependence. So I think we're learning to read those measurements, and those measurements are pretty new as well. Yeah, uh, very interesting talk, and two questions. One is, I'm intrigued with this business of a double exponential uh, during at the end of a flare. A single exponential decay rate suggests a measurement of the density of the plasma that is um, cooling. Yeah, that would be a, by a double. Um, right. Telling us. You think this first exponential, which has about the same time scale as the rise phase, uh, is the beam shutting off uh, and the, the localized region where the beam hits, the electron or possibly proton beam hits, turning off. We think this long decay here is the teapot cooling. We think this is the larger sort of active region around the flare, around the flare foot point, cooling in a teapot manner. Okay. Sounds interesting. Uh, second is, it would be really useful to determine the amount of energy in flares divided by the volumetric luminosity of the star as a function of stellar age. Because that's sort of a measure, a rough measure, of the amount of energy in the magnetic field that's being converted into visible light. Absolutely. Uh, and you probably have enough data to do this. Have you done it? Are you planning to do it? We have only done it uh, in that we've added up all the energy for this one star. We've done that for this star. We've added up all the flare energy we've seen for this M dwarf. It is going to be done when we do our ensemble. Um, so right now, the code is running. Our first pass of flare finding for all 200,000 stars is running right now. Um, uh, for Kepler-17, for the G-dwarf, we see no flares, which is also maybe troubling. Kepler-17 has star spot modulations that are comparable to this M-dwarf, but no flares, which is, which is interesting. Uh, I don't have the number on hand. I think Suzanne Hawley's paper has it in it from last year. Um, it will be kind of a far out question. Um, over the last several decades, I've had the, been cursed with the responsibility to review papers for various journals that claimed planet Jupiter was driving the solar cycle. For a week ago, about Mercury maybe also having some influence but, on this? <laughs> you know, I don't think, I mean, the numbers clearly don't work out for the solar case. However, you have all this data for Kepler on stellar activity, and you have lots of, lots of stars with close in giants. You could do a real study and nail this one down forever, it seems to me. <laughs> Has anybody tried to do that? Uh, I th there have certainly been conversations in the Kepler community about it. Um, I think there have been indications of planets. Well, there have been some interesting planets that are very close that are affecting uh, like the UV luminosity of their stars. Uh, we haven't seen it in flares yet, but I'll give the same sort of caveat that our data is still churning in the machine right now. So basically looking for things like periodicity and the flare rate could be one way of looking at it. So if you're seeing flares preferentially show up, uh, say the planet doesn't quite transit. Say we don't see the planet directly. If the planet slightly misaligned and just doesn't quite transit, and yet was still really influencing the magnetic activity of that star, Naively, we might expect the flares to occur when that planet uh, is present, not when that face of the star was present. So we might see a periodicity. So that is one of the measurements we're making. We're doing uh, periodograms of the flares, basically, the flare occurrence times. Uh, we don't have, so from this handful of stars we did manually, we have not seen the indication. Um, but it's an open question.
Are the time scales for the different flares the same, irrespective of magnitude? Uh, yeah. So, so what this model? I'm going to show it here. Uh, this model is parameterized with only two terms. There's the amplitude, and there's the time scale. So when we normalized the peak amplitude, and we normalized to this, we used the full with half max, which basically just measures the impulsive time scale. So it's being driven basically by the rise time and the, mostly by the impulsive, the rapid decay. Um, those two features basically recover the entire flare shape. Um, so with amplitude, we do see some slow flares. So lower amplitude, slow flares. We do see some high amplitude, very short duration flares. So there, it's, not one, it's not one dimension. Uh, there does seem to be a time scale and an amplitude that seem to be se semi-independent. Uh, and another thing about the complex flares, I mean, there's a certain uh, probability of those not being yes. related. Yeah, the, there, there is a superposition problem here where you could have random flares happening everywhere and you would just, and certainly, right, certainly there are some. Like, you know, I, we'll just off the cuff say, maybe this is one, right? This right here at the very tail could just be a random superposition of a, another event somewhere else in the star. Uh, we have done uh, some of them sort of Monte Carlo statistics and Poisson statistics that tell us uh, that there are some fraction of these events which are superpositions, but most of them are not. So these complex events happen too frequently um, for that to be occurring. We don't know which ones, but statistically we know that these are not just superpositions, which is, which is cool. And that's something that was discussed in the 70s, but with flare samples of like 100 flares, and you couldn't do it from that. So you showed this power law dependence um, of frequency on energy, flare energy. But then you just told us that the amplitude and time scale for flares um, have no necessary relation to one another. Naive uh, avalanche models of flares would suggest that one power law for time scale, one different power law Amplitude. You're collapsing two of these things into one. That sounds like magic. How does it happen? Uh, so this event energy, uh, energy on this axis, uh, this event energy is the integral of the flare from the start to the stop time. So we're not, we're model independent, right? We're just doing the integral of the event. Um, we have not made this diagram for just. I don't know how to. I guess I don't know how to decouple that. How how. How do you make a similar kind of diagram where you're looking at just where you can sort of control for the time scale being fixed to the amplitude? Because I agree, there would, there would be a naive assumption. Now, it's not completely decoupled. You don't have a tiny flare with a three hour, um, with a three hour duration. Small flares in energy usually have small time scales. Um, but there is not a strict one to one in terms of the parameters that we fit in terms of the amplitude and the duration. Sounds like nature's trying to tell us. You showed in one plot that the differential rotation had a prefactor k, which was 0.2. Uh, but then you also said that all these stars were rapidly rotating. I find 0.2 rather big for rapid rotators. 0.2 is the value for the sun. Um, we, we are getting a value even larger. Let's see if I can find this. So we find a value. Um, we find, yeah, we find a value of 0.8, right, even larger. Um, yeah, so even stronger differential rotation. Um, that's right, yeah, this would be, ex this is very high amounts of differential rotation. Um, there is the convolution of spot evolution here, right, where we're sort of smearing that in with spot evolution on size scales smaller than the planet. So it, hidden in here, right, is that the planet uh, that's occulting the star and occulting the star spots is 0.13 solar radii in size. So it's very large. Larger probably than most spots. Uh, certainly larger than most sunspots. Uh, we don't have a lot of spots on the sun that are 13% the radius. Uh, so when you take that large object and you move it across the region, you're sort of physically convolving those two things. So you can't really get features that are smaller than the radius of, you're not sensitive to features that are smaller than the radius of the planet. And that turned out to be a pretty limiting factor in the size scale that we're sensitive to. No matter what cadence you hit this with, if you looked at it with a millisecond cadence, you would still be limited by basically the convolution of the planet crossing the spot. Um, 
we also don't get much constraint on latitude, right? So there is a 13, you know, 0.13 sol solar stellar radii of latitude that it could be within. So the fact that we do see a range of periods within this latitude band is pretty interesting. Um, now this could be spots that are just above and grazing, and this could be spots going right through the midplane of the transit. Um, but it's a pretty large area uh, of latitude to be, to be spanning. So which ideally, you'd love infinite signal to noise and a very small planet going around the star so that you trace out small scale details and you'd love it to be a little bit misaligned so you had a much better constraint on the latitude. That would be the perfect system and it would be too small to observe. The, the transits would be too weak. Um, so these, these bumps that we're seeing are a factor of a few smaller than the transit. So there's another signal to noise argument there that becomes sort of problematic. Let's uh, thank uh, James again. Thank you. Thank you.